Hello, I'm Bilge Nunt. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Biodiversity Genomics, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we can improve aquatic metabarcoding by means of designing and evaluating primers, as well as uh, sorting our samples by their size or biomass. To begin with, what is metabarcoding? Metabarcoding is a tool to identify the contents of a meta or a mixed sample, like you see in this picture here, by using genetic markers. Um, and like with everything in life, there are also challenges to this approach called metabarcoding. One of the one of these challenges is actually kind of obvious from this picture. Uh, in a mixed sample like this, we can have specimens that can come in various different sizes and masses. So if I were to take the sample, grind it up, sequence everything in it, uh, will I be able to get capture the you know signal from the very tiny specimen versus the very large one? That can be an issue. Another challenge could be designing and evaluating primers to identify the diversity of this given sample. Uh, for instance, in this particular case, we may have tens of hundreds of uh, taxonomic groups, different taxonomic groups. Uh, but if I were to have primers that are very conserved, like very poorly designed, they may just uh, preferentially target only some of the taxa. So other species will go undetected. And that can be an issue as well. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on these challenges and try and address them. To begin with, specimens that can come in various different sizes and masses. Uh, well, we need to first build a mock sample to you know, test this, to address this. Uh, so here you can see some of my uh, samples. Uh, overall, they were collected in four different countries, Finland, France, Germany, and Canada by several collaborators. What we did was that we got the tissue, subsampled the tissue, extracted the DNA, and amplified a full length GO1, which was then Sanger sequenced. And after uh, the Sanger sequencing, uh, I got all these sequences, and um, for my mock sample, I used 401 of them that each correspond to individual operational taxonomic units. But for the rest of the talk, I'm going to refer to them as individual species. And this mock sample is actually pretty diverse. You can see that it ranges from crustaceans, worms, mollusks to insects, hence the challenge. What's more is that um, e each of these specimens, they all come in different size categories. Uh, basically, I split them into a total of four. So you see here uh, overall five actually, X, X small, small, medium, large, and X large. But I just simply didn't have enough tissue for the X small and small, so I combine them together. So hence, we have four size categories overall. And what I do is that I get uh, these individual size categories and I grind them up individually. And that's what I'm going to be using for the experiment. Okay, so if you were to look at these individual taxonomic groups in terms of you know how many specimens we have in the mock sample coming from these different groups, uh, you can see quite a bit of variation here in terms of their abundance. And for instance, if you look at this diptera, the flies, uh, it seems to be uh, contributing quite a lot to the overall diversity in the mock sample. And if we then look at these size, individual size categories, we're going to see that uh, the very small ones actually do almost make up half of our mock sample. So if I want to capture this diversity at this order level, as well as in this you know, individual uh, size category level, I need to do something about this. And the way I uh, address this is by uh, building two mock samples. One I call sorted, which is a way to balance for the amount of tissue that come from each of these specimens. And because we have um, a lot more in the small size category. And I also have an unsorted mock sample uh, for which I will basically just get the equal amount of tissue from each of these size categories. Okay, so that was challenge number one. The challenge too is the primer design and evaluation, uh, is especially for a sample that's as diverse as ours, like you see here. So fret not, um, I'll explain to you what this colorful figure is all about. So um, after building my mock sample and after knowing you know, what I put inside a mock sample in terms of the taxonomic groups, then I went to Bold and GemBank and I downloaded all the sequences for each of these individual groups. So in each row, basically what you see is that for each individual taxonomic group, in this case, Trichoptera, 
uh, these are the alignment of the different sequences that are found in that group. And if you look at the, the columns, then you're going to see the uh, proportion of each of the nucleotides at each position. So on the x-axis, you see the position uh, basically in this whole CO1 gene, which is overall a 658 base pair. So what I've done is that um, basically I just uh, I went through the whole CO1 gene and I tried to, uh, be, for designing my primers, I tried to find those uh, areas uh, that have some limited variation. So you can see, for instance, uh, the very conserved versus very variable areas uh, among uh, across this gene, right? So in order to design my primer, um, I want some limited variation, uh, but I also need some versatility simply because I have uh, so much diversity. So you can see in those uh, big uh, black boxes, uh, basically the areas where I've designed two of my primers. And uh, yeah, I try to find, um, again, as I mentioned, some conserved areas as well as um, some variability. And that's basically um, how I design the primers by adding some versatility, in other words, degeneracy. But this is in silico approach. How does that work when it comes to the in vitro approach? So overall, um, from the literature, as well as from those that we've designed, we had we started with 31 primer pairs for uh, the experiment. But after um, running gradient PCR um, from 44 to 66 degrees, um, I found that 46 degree was the most optimal for most primers. But it also meant that for some of the primer pairs, we simply didn't get anything, like there was no amplification. Hence, um, I'll continue with 20 primer pr pairs uh, for the metabarcoding study. Um, so after deciding on which primers work best and uh, obtaining the PCR products, uh, which primers work best, I basically uh, have done this uh, thing called two-step PCR. Um, for more details, you can refer to this paper, Aldrich and Steinke 2018. And I've uh, pulled everything and sequenced using aluminum iSeq and then the bioinformatics processing. So um, what do we get out of this? Uh, this is showing you a species accumulation curve. On the x-axis, you can see the um, different read depth. So going all the way up to 1 million reads. And on the y-axis is the number of taxa detected. And different colors indicate different primer pairs. And what is uh, striking here is that, well, if you look at this particular primer pair, uh, you can see that it's not really capturing uh, much of the diversity um, simply because there was not enough reads. So uh, basically, I'll continue um, the rest of the experiment, rest of the analyses without this primer. So I'll be left with 19 primers in total. What you also see is that, well, if you want to compare all these different primer pairs, we need to kind of normalize them. And um, I found that uh, around 100K was a good number to normalize all these primer pairs. Okay, so this is basically showing you primer pairs versus number of taxa detected uh, at this subsampled, uh, like 100K um, read value. So overall, you can see here is that, well, most of our primers seem to be doing pretty well in terms of capturing most of the diversity, but um, we, can also see that some primers are doing uh, better than others. So I basically picked these uh, top four primer pairs that do recover more than 93% of the overall uh, taxonomic diversity. And um, if we look at these primer pairs in a bit more detail, what we find out is that, well, both the forward and reverse primers in these top four or best four primer pairs uh, have some levels of degeneracy. So, um, and if you were to look at the verse four, which basically captured less than 83% of the overall diversity, um, in those cases, either only one primer had degeneracy or overall the combined degeneracy was low. So that tells us something. Uh, so when we uh, want to identify uh, the diversity in a mixed sample like ours, uh, we do want to add some levels of degeneracy in both forward and reverse primers. But again, this was a very uh, diverse sample uh, comprising of 31 different orders. And if your sample is uh, much less diverse, then you will need to adjust for that as well. And if we were to, again, look at these best uh, four primer pairs uh, in more detail, uh, what you see here in this figure is on the x-axis, the targeted amplicon size, 
and on the y-axis is the proportion of reefs that were removed uh, due to the low reef quality during the quality filtering. So you can see clear trends here. Uh, the longer your amplicon sizes in both experiments, ported and unported, um, the more reefs you lose. So if you want to be able to um, retain more reefs, um, you may be better off by uh, targeting shorter um, CO1 fragments, like in our uh, primus, you can see the case. Okay, in terms of the other challenge, where you know, do we need to actually sort the sample, um, the tissue, uh, or not? Uh, again, you can see the species explanation curves here for these two experiments number of individuals on the x-axis and species diversity on the y-axis. And different colors, again, indicate different primer pairs. Uh, at first look, what we can see uh, or notice already is that they are pretty similar. But if you were to run a statistical test on these uh, two different communities, we're also finding uh, actually very significantly similar communities. That is telling us that, well, we may not need necessarily need to sort this subsample tissue by biomass. Um, and that's great news. That's basically going to save us uh, a lot of time in this kind of experiments. So in conclusion, what we see is that, um, well, what we recommend here is based on these results is that there are these four primer pairs that recover more than 93% of the diversity in such a diverse aquatic sample. And uh, two of these uh, primer pairs were newly designed. So if uh, any of you uh, would like to find more, um, find out more about these, uh, you can contact me. And also when designing primers for aquatic metabarcoding with this sequencing platform that I've used here, Illumina MySeq, uh, well, you want to add some degeneracy uh, in both ordinary reverse primers. And also um, you may be better off by targeting uh, shorter amplicon lengths, like I've, sh I've shown you earlier. And in terms of the uh, sorting versus not sorting, uh, we've found no significant difference between these two samples. So you may be better off by not uh, sorting um, subsample tissue. With that, I'd like to thank our collaborators for sending us all these samples uh, from these different countries. Uh, Vasco for helping uh, troubleshoot the jam pipeline, uh, the funding uh, resources, and uh, the Center for Biodiversity Genomics, and as well as the Shankala people. Thank you very much.